Welcome to episode 69 of The Leap Home, Ghost Ship. In this week's episode, Sam has to help pilot a light aircraft through the Bermuda Triangle to ensure one of his passengers is able to receive medical treatment before her ruptured appendix causes her death. When the past impinges on the captain's decision making, can Sam persuade him to try and save the ailing passenger's life? Or will fear trump hope and make him turn the plane around? Giant prehistoric lizard fish have been seen by sailors in the... Bur- What's so funny? What are you laughing about? Good afternoon. How are things? Not too bad, Jerry. You escaped from those sea monsters? Lizard people? You mean the, the royal family or... The government? <laughs> yeah, no doubt. thought this was quite a claustrophobic episode this week. Yeah, not a lot of dynamism. Sam behaved himself fairly well. He kept his hands to himself for the most part. I'd like to think so with a, a married woman with her husband there and a... And a, a sick. Well, in fact, they're almost. Well, he was getting, he was taking clothes off at one point, I think, for a, an examination. I'm not sure the, the a legitimate purpose. Well, do you need to remove the the clothing? Yes. To press on something? I'm sure you do. Okay. Before we begin, rattle off the the socials as usual. We're at Leap Home Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, etc. We are show noting at theleaphome dot com. Is that a, a verb? Is it show noting? It is now. And you can find each episode one week early over on the Colombo Podcast Productions YouTube channel. This was a uh, quite a, a strange episode in, in many ways. Fairly unique, I thought. Fairly you, unique. You don't like that, do you, when there's degrees of uniqueness? They're, <laughs> Alan, all, they're all technically unique. Alan Patrick. This one shared fewer characteristics with some of the other episodes than is maybe the standard. And a bit of a uh, role reversal when it comes to uh, nonsense and mumbo jumbo compared to previous weeks. Yes. We can get into this. But on the plus side, two extremely hot women. Is that what you look for in an episode? Yes, it's one of my... That's what Al looks for in an episode. Do you want to get going? Let's crack on. The introduction is much the same as we saw at the end of last week's episode. Sam leaps into a pilot immediately, drops his cigarette and performs a pantomime confusion before... Realising that he's nose diving towards the sea and letting out an oh boy. After the credits, we return to the pit of cocks, where we find him gripping the controls and trying to bring the plane back while remembering the old joke about the emergency position being uh, so that you can kiss your butt goodbye. That's a, I'm not sure if he created it, but that's a Billy Connolly joke. Is it? Mm-hmm. Well, Billy Connolly was around well before 1992, so. Possibly, yeah. They probably stole it from him. Who knows? Fortunately, Sam is not alone, and a military uniformed co-pilot called Cooper joins Eddie and helps him right the craft before asking him if the autopilot has flipped out again. Sam is very confused but manages to not put his foot too far into it and agrees that that might well be what happened. Yeah, he's also quite pleased, I think, or bemused to hear that they're headed to Bermuda before a number of incidents occur showing that Sam has... No clue what he's doing uh, with all the, the knobs and switches, etc. Yeah, he's completely out of his depth here. And we've seen this before when he's been faced with flying things. He doesn't really like it, does he? I can sympathise. Every time I see a, a cockpit, there's there's too many buttons. I mean, how they many do you actually many, need? There are literally hundreds of these things up in the ceiling and down the side. I mean, what are they all for, really? They should streamline it. Four or five buttons at most. Up, down. Left, right, <laughs> yeah. stop. Stick the radio on, <laughs> autopilot, that's all you need. Complicating things. I think that's actually just, it's a barrier to entry. Oh, I couldn't be a pilot, there's so many of those buttons and switches to... It's to scare folk off so they exactly. can hoard the money for mm. themselves. Yeah. Big piloting. <laughs> in, in any case, Cooper advises that he should tell the passengers that they have hit an air pocket to allay any fears, even though they both know that there's no such thing. Yeah, Sam, even in his confusion, is able to recognise that there is no such thing as an airport. Well, I'm not sure he's right. But turbulence isn't turbulence it? is pockets of different pressure. So yeah. air pocket, it's not. Mm. I mean, it's not a pocket just of air, but it's <laughs> it's air and it's a pocket. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, they both notice that the compasses are out of whack, and as Sam struggles to tune in the. I was going to say a radio, but I'm not sure. It's more of a like a sonar type. Uh, I don't know. It's a communication device, but it's not. You're not speaking to. To someone directly at the tower, I don't think. You're just picking up a signal. Yes. They call it something odd, like a big dog mm-hmm. or a duck. I don't know. 
I wasn't really paying attention to all the jargon in this episode. I hope you were taking notes. No, I wasn't. Um, and they assume that they're now off course because they can't, or Sam can't, uh, you know, find this a signal. Sure. And Cooper indicates there's some kind of magnetic disturbance. However, at this point, they're interrupted by, as I mentioned, a very hot blonde air hostess. I think her name is Wendy. Yeah, she sticks her head through to check that everything is okay and suggests one of them come back and tell Junior that everything is fine as both he and his bride look a bit pale. Now, this was a weird arc or a weird lack of character development or ch- even change of direction. Junior, is, as we are about to find out, comes across immediately as a obnoxious arse. He does. And you'd expect him to be like that the entire episode. However, I think very quickly... We find that he's, he's actually fine. He's not that... I, I didn't really warm to him. Yeah, I thought he was absolutely fine. You know, I thought that he'd be... There's going to be more antagonism between him and his uh, his new wife. I thought that maybe he'd be more pre- presented as being more domineering and abusive. And I think actually they both care for each other and it's shown that. And there's no suggestion that there's the relationship is in any way unhealthy. No, but he does come across as a spoiled little rich kid. Yeah, but I expected that to continue. But after that, it starts off with that. Then after that, he's actually fine. He's asking, he's thankful, he's asking for help. He's not demand. He's not threatening anyone yeah, to be well, sacked. Think, yeah, people have layers, don't they? Yeah. The fact that he's maybe a bit arrogant, a bit entitled, doesn't mean he doesn't also care for his wife and appreciate when she's been helped. Of course, but normally in a, a TV show... Yeah, you got one-dimensional characters, yeah. and he's not... Okay, that's yeah. fair. Cooper remarks that uh, Junior is as much of an ass as his daddy, which makes Wendy laugh, but reminds him that he could get fired. And we find out that uh, Wendy and Cooper are husband and wife. Yes, and I think, to put that in context, Junior is the son of the guy who owns the plane. Or the airline, yeah. Well, no, he's a petroleum heir, so the guy's the... The father's main work must be in right, sure, yeah. So he must, this must be his private jet. And Al, I think, later on says it's been kitted out for executive use. So yes. I assume that Cooper and his wife are permanent staff. And maybe Sam is relatively recently added to that, from what we learn. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. Okay. Sam passes her on his way to the cabin. And she asks what really happened and seems quite concerned, but laughs again when is told about the air pocket. So she obviously knows that the air pocket isn't a thing according to, according yeah, well, to them. Yeah, well, she's probably been on enough flights to know what's going on. She then goes through to the cockpit and remarks to her husband that Sam looks a bit green around the gills and wet. So, mm. again, reference to him being fairly new in the role. She also, I think, uh, there's a sort of weird dynamic here between her and uh, and Coop. She looks at him quite lovingly, uh-huh. but he doesn't respond. And, uh, you know, this is the first indication that he's other things going on. And I think she's a little bit Concerned. Yeah, it's not his normal behaviour, maybe. Yeah, or maybe it is his normal behaviour. It's a, a frequent, you know. Yeah, well, mm. talking about normal behaviour, <laughs> Sam at this point gets a quick look at his reflection and for some reason tries to read his name tag he in the mirror. Apparently doesn't know how mirrors work. Yeah, he's completely forgotten that and he's forgotten he can just look down and read the sign on his badge. Yeah, before he meets the obnoxious junior, he is complaining about his spilled drink and how that apparently never happens when he's. His dad's on board. Sam reckons that's just lucky, hmm. not really having a clue what's going on. And as Junior goes off to freshen up, he suggests Sam reassures Michelle that they're not crashing. So in the cabin, Wendy comes out and takes a glass from Sam to do the, the top up. Obviously, that's her job and not the pilot's job. As he approaches Michelle and awkwardly offers her congratulations for the second time yeah. after seeing a newlywed banner being displayed. Why would it not occur to him that he might have said this already? He it's never he never thinks about context when he leaps into somebody. He just no. reacts to things. Mm-hmm. Anyway, she declines his offer of a new drink for herself and uh, takes a bit of a funny turn. Yeah, she collapses into a seat with what she calls stomach cramps. However... She quickly tries to cover it and asks Sam not to tell Junior who returns as much of a dick as he was before and insists that his obviously reluctant wife take another drink. Now, th- at this point, I'm thinking, yeah, this is a, a domineering, abusive relationship. Well, and yeah, because you're, you're guided in that direction when she doesn't want him to know that she's not feeling well. Yes. You're wondering why. And that's what I'm saying. It just seems odd that they make him out like this, but then very quickly that just, just gets dropped and he acts normally. Well, it may even be that that's a facade that he does keep up, but when he realises his wife's genuinely ill, he drops it because he's genuinely concerned for her. Yeah. Maybe. Anyway, 
Sam messes up again. He calls Wendy a stewardess. He, he already knows she's married to Cooper. So why is he talking about her in that? Um, no, but he's talking. Yeah, but he's talking to Junior. Yeah, but he says the stewardess as if she's a stranger or yeah. a member of staff. Yeah, yeah. Well, does he know her name at this point? How else would she refer? Would he well, refer I suppose to maybe he's yeah trying to cover for yeah. the fact he doesn't. No, well, maybe it's, did Cooper say when she came into the cabin? I don't know, but also we do know that Sam is new, so he's not you know necessarily and you know close terms with both of them. Yeah, but he, Junior does say to him that's a strange way to refer to Wendy. Yeah. Anyhow, he insists that his wife has another drink and sends Sam to get it. And he doubles down on this questionable behaviour by referring to Michelle that these pilots act like they're doing you a favour if you ask for anything other than to be flown from point A to point B. That's literally all their job is. He's, he's, a, he's a pilot, he's not a steward. Yeah. Oh, that does remind me of the Jerry Seinfeld uh, bit where he talks about pilots insisting and telling you you know, that what altitude they'll be flying at and they'll be going left over here and right. It's like, I don't care, just take me up, bring, your, bring me down and, and that's it. I don't need to know everything about your job. It's the opposite of that, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, but at this point as well, it's, you know, the, the kiss after his moaning. And again, it does look genuine, so it's not like she yeah. shirks back. So it's, it's a weird, they're trying to, you know, try, try to figure out this relationship. You get a sense of his entitlement here though, because... When she says that she, at the moment, would settle for just getting to point B, he tells her to stop thinking like Michelle Temple and start thinking like Mrs. Cutter. Yeah, but I, I, I don't think that's a, an issue. I don't think it's a problem. He is obviously super rich. Yes. And she, it's implied, Wasn't, comes yeah. from a, a more an average background. And I think that would be that, that would be an accurate re reflection. The person coming not used to this environment would be a bit more apprehensive and not know how things work. And yeah. he's basically saying, listen... I mean, I suppose now, one interpretation of his behaviour is that he's showing off to her. Yes. He's trying to show off like, you know, I'm very wealthy, this is my plane. And oh, they're, they're, you know, they've been married, so I imagine they've been around together for a, a number of... Some people can't help it, can they? Yeah. No, don't, don't, don't get me wrong, he, you know, he's not, at this point, yeah, he's, he's, not, he's not a nice guy, but yeah, it is his plane and these people are, yeah, just staff for him. Yeah, but you don't need to treat them that way. No, but I'm not sure how bad it actually is. Mm. He's, he's mourning to Michelle. He's yeah, not privately, this, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, in the galley, Wendy gives Sam a version of the customer is always right. Yes, definitely when it comes to who wants a drink or, or not. But he's more concerned about how Michelle looks, but doesn't get a chance to discuss it with her as she leaves just as Al arrives, but in, in time to have a quick pair about her. Of course. He's delighted to be in a grooming goose, which is the type of plane. Right. Or grumming. Grooming. Yeah, he, he tries to give Sam some aviation history before he focuses back on the more important task at hand after Wendy has walked through to the cabin. It's August 13th, 1956. You're a co-pilot by the name of... Eddie Mackin, right here. Oh yeah, Francis Edward Brackett. Uh, you're an, a fledgling airborne limo driver. <laughs> Maybe he is, but I'm not. In case you don't remember, I don't drive these things. Well, you did great as a, as a rocket test pilot. I crashed. Not before you broke Mach 3 first. Among other things. Come on, it's easy. It's like it's like riding a bike. Yeah, only when you fall off of a plane, you crash and burn. Uh, it's called buying the farm. Well, whatever it's called, you're dead. Okay, okay, so my analogy isn't perfect. It stinks. You're, uh, you're flying uh, Grant Cutter Jr., who's the heir to a huge pet. Petroleum, oh, Petroleum Company, and his new bride. To Bermuda, nice? I know that, yeah. yes, oh, it's oh, nice. Only you never get there. We crash? No, calm down. We you crash? Don't, no, you don't crash. You turn around and you go back to Norwich, Virginia, which is where you took off from. Why, we have some kind of engine trouble or something, is that it? Well, I would imagine there's some kind of a problem, mechanical, or else why, why would you go back? Except. Except, except what? Well, uh, it's only an hour to Bermuda, and it's four hours back to Norwich, Virginia, so why, you know, if you got a problem, go all the way back. Why don't we ask Ziggy? Uh, oh, Ziggy. Ask, ask Ziggy. Yeah. Okay, well, okay, I'll ask Ziggy, but I, I'm having a lot of problems. What? What's wrong with uh, Ziggy says, I don't know, you got a sick pass. Huh? Pass Pass Michelle, Pass yeah, she's got a stomachache, I know that. Oh, no, no, she's got, huh? oh, she's got a cute... Huh? Appen, appendicitis, appendicitis. Appendicitis? Appendicitis. Appendicitis? What's cute about that? Ow. Ow. 
Alan. I know they're trying to make Alan sort of the, you know, the comedy foil, but why would Alan not know what appendicitis or how to pronounce it? Yeah, it's not a obscure word, especially for a scientist. That's right. And how often are they going to do the joke where the text runs out and it's mm. in the middle of a word every week? As often as we're going to discuss the fact that Sam's inconsistent, and I'm picturing them sitting in the writers' room going, Haha, "I've got an idea for this yeah. week." Well, if he's trying to say petroleum, but it stops after pet. <laughs> And they'll think he's got a huge bunny rabbit. Anyway. Just after what we heard, the two of them realise that the plane is turning. So Sam heads into the cockpit to investigate. Coop still seems uneasy when Sam returns to his seat. And he tells him they have no choice but to turn around as all their navigation controls are malfunctioning. And going west is better than east where they might miss Bermuda. Yeah, he's concerned that the autopilot's taking them off track and that they aren't on track for Bermuda anymore after all and that going back the way, you'll definitely find land eventually. However, Sam notes that the compass seems to have settled but a slightly embarrassed Coop tells him that that's because they have left the Bermuda Triangle. Ooh. Well, I think he can contradict himself a little bit here. He says that they should get out of the Triangle shortly. So maybe it's because they're leaving. It's improving the situation. Yeah. yeah, And we'll be back home in three and a half hours. Sam's concerned because obviously he wants Michelle looked after. Yeah, he points out they're only an hour from Bermuda and doesn't accept that they simply can't see it. Yeah, that's not persuasive to, to Cooper. and Not even when he's told about Michelle's prognosis is he persuaded to change his plan. No, he, he doesn't argue necessarily with a diagnosis. I don't know why not but doesn't change his mind about turning back and orders him to head to the cabin and check on her and also to tell Junior that, the, that there's a change of plan due to mechanical problems. So on the way through, we see Al in the galley struggling with his hand link, blaming the Bermuda Triangle. Now, this is where I'm seeing a sort of reversal of uh, attitudes here. Sam is now being the, correctly being the sceptic and Al is trying to convince him that that the phenomenon <laughs> phenomenon do, 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 do. is genuine. I think we heard that at the top of the podcast. So after a few weeks ago with uh, Sam believing in psychics when there was a, a hot chick he wanted to bang and Al well, thinking it was nonsense, now he believes that's garbage and Sam is being more scientific. Maybe the Bermuda Triangle just needs to be more vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> after this nonsense, Ziggy comes back online and they find out that they have, in fact, flown out of the triangle, which Al, for some reason, takes his confirmation that he was right. Sam, however, has another explanation. What's that? He says it was the circling UFO that's caused this. <laughs> this leads the, the gullible Al to scramble and check what's going on outside. Sam also asks about Michelle's outcome in the original timeline. Yeah, she dies. That's not good, is it? Well, it's not ideal. She died an hour before landing back in, I think it's Norwich, is that right? Yes. So Sam realises that they have to get her to Bermuda and insists that Ziggy must direct them. Just then, Wendy comes back to say that Sam needs to take another look at Michelle. Yeah, she's in a bad way. So in the cabin, we find she is indeed not well. She's lying back and sweating. I think she's got a bit of a fever on the go. She does. With Junior beside her, but she tries to make a joke about uh, being a married woman when Sam asks to look at her. Also, why would they just accept Sam looking at her? A pilot, yep. To be fair, we do learn that he spent a year at medical school. But would they know that? Well, the Wendy knows that. She tells them right now. Yeah, but why would uh, Michelle and Junior know that and be... Maybe just from his demeanour. He comes across as knowing what he's talking about. <laughs> I'll unbutton your dress here. i to slip my hand in. There we go. Uh, and also we find out that Sam's a married man, I think. He's got a wedding ring on, yes. And a kid, Jew. We won't hear that yet, but we do learn that later. So he opens her dress and uh, finds a swelling, fortunately not in his own undergarments, but in hers, <laughs> and tries to assure her and Junior that she'll be fine, but does have appendicitis. Michelle apologises at this point for not mentioning that she was in pain before getting on board the plane. Yeah, and um, of course Junior wants to be convinced. Well, of Sam's credentials, yes, but he does seem visibly concerned. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he tells her there's nothing to apologise for. And at this point, Wendy, she starts to mention that they aren't going to Bermuda. But Sam cuts her off and goes to get some pain How relief. How does she know she's not been in the cockpit since they turned the plane around? 
Hajmin are you sure I don't think so she was Sam was in the cockpit as soon as it started to turn and she wasn't there yeah unless Cooper said to her way earlier if this doesn't get better I'm turning the plane around and she's realised maybe either that or give them credit for that I suppose aliens UFOs have put the message in her head that they're turning back to North. anyway Sam won't let her tell them that's happening because I think he still thinks he can persuade Cooper that Bermuda is the answer in the galley Sam reveals that Michelle won't make it back to Norwich as he gives Wen- Wendy aspirin and tells her <laughs> to microwave some towels. Thank you, Sam. You know what year it is. And, and he says it like, oh, not in 56. <laughs> Come on, man. Aye, a time traveller. I've had trouble <laughs> with this. In the cockpit, he tells uh, Coop about Michelle's medical condition and that they don't have time to return. However, he refuses to risk everyone's life based on his medical diagnosis even though sam gives him accurate coordinates that he received from al well i've got the note here al informs sam of their exact location if you think sam will find a logical way to share that information <laughs> you haven't been paying attention <laughs> it just says as uh, usual just says this is the case yeah so there's no possible way that anyone's going to buy it, especially an ex- more experienced pilot yeah. who knows what he's doing he's like how on earth would you know that yeah, I mean, as well as a, a less experienced pilot who's now also part doctor. Yeah, he's an expert in everything all of a sudden. Anyway, Cooper quite rightly says to him, look, I'm smarter than you, I've done this more and I can't tell, so what? where are you getting this from? And when Al demands an urgent confab in the galley, we find out why he has this attitude as we see him adjust the radio and then go into a bit of a trance. Get it? My compass is spinning faster than a West Texas twister. Uh, this is Shark 2. Roger that. And my gyro is tumbled. Shark 3. Roger that. Hey, cool, Sharks. I know this pond like my bathtub. Skipper, I got a Liberty ship at my 10 o'clock. Steaming northeast. She'll bring the U-boat up. Watch for a periscope wake east or west of her. In 1944, Cooper located and sunk seven U-boats in the Bermuda Triangle. This guy has spent more time in the Triangle than half the ships that disappeared. Well, then why is he so reluctant to fly back into it? Well, maybe because he respects it or he knows how lethal it can... it can be. Uh Uh-oh. 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 In November of that year, Cooper and the three aircraft he was leading Disappeared without a trace. Disappeared. Now the guy's right here. He's flying the plane. Yeah, yeah, what? Eight days later, he was picked up still wearing his May West by a passing tanker. It was a miracle. But no one knows what happened to the rest of his flight, not, not even him. He couldn't remember anything that happened that day. Shark one, you see the squall line moving in from the south? You'll never spot that you by watching squall lines boil. It, uh, just really looks weird, Skipper. Skipper, Shark 3. My instruments are bouncing. Engine temp, RPMs, cylinder head. They're all swinging from peg to peg. Cooper? Cooper? You okay? During that, um, that clip there, we saw footage of the, 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 the sky, the clouds. Was that the same stock footage you used for the credits? Oh, it might be. I don't know. I think it might be. Um, I would guess potentially. Normally they don't show anything in the credits that hasn't already been in the show, so unless they used it for the credits first. Yeah, the, yeah, the credits but were just have, a lot of the search ex- for yeah. uh, you know, clouds. Well, no, a lot of the exterior, I've got it in the trivia where the exteriors come from, so we'll get to that later on. And it would make sense that it would also be that. Um, talking of trivia, I should mention what a Mae West is. It's a inflatable yellow life jacket. I'm assuming because it rhymes with life vest, May West. Do they have Cockney rhyme, rhyming slang in the states yeah. in the fifty? Well, they've got to have a reason to name things. Why would else would we call them May uh, West? Maybe it inflates and it's quite buxom. Well, that's, that's another possibility. Who knows? I'm not sure if she's not notoriously buxom, mind you. Anyway, I don't know. It's, it's bright yellow, and it's, it was a f- model that was used for that period of time. Okay, back in the cockpit, Sam returns and shakes Coop from his trance. And then Al's advice suggests that he try and tune in to Bermuda on the, the navigation system. Cooper says today is not the day to push into this pond. No, but they do get a signal. And Coop admits that Sam was right about the direction. And 
when he tells them he was also right about Michelle's condition, he reluctantly agrees to stake all their lives on his opinion and turns the plane towards Bermuda. Ooh. Mm. We get a bit of a fade out back in. It's a bit later and Al tells Sam that flying like this is like writing with a quill pen when you could be using a computer. I think he prefers autopilot. Yes. Cooper then decides that he needs to go and have a look at Michelle and tells Sam to take over the controls and he panics. I'm not sure why. It's like a plane is quite stable. If It's not like a, a car which Sam just over, bends. It's going to dive. Yeah, why? Just sit there and don't do anything. This just is actually, it's quite inconsistently shown in the episodes. Every time Sam takes control, the plane lurches out of control. It's like, don't do anything. You can yeah. just sit back there and not touch it. Yeah. Sam tries to make an excuse and go to the toilet, but he's not allowed because he's called it the wrong thing. And also, is this a, I think this is a point where we find out that Sam's wife is expecting. Yes, because Sam, for some reason, shouts to Al while mm. Cooper's still there and he has to cover his tracks and... Cooper thinks it's baby brain of some kind. Yeah. Anyway, he struggles with keeping the plane level and resorts to putting the autopilot back on before listening to Al and adjusting a knob to avoid an oncoming storm cloud. He seems quite smug about this. It's yeah. a ridiculous reaction. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Al points out he's not actually doing any flying. Back in the cabin, Michelle is feeling slightly better due to the pain relief in towels. And Coop tells her that they will be landing in Bermuda in about an hour. She's heard that before, quite some time ago. Yes. And he explains to them that they've had to navigate around some thunder bumpers. Unfortunately, in the cockpit, Al informs Sam that although the chances of Michelle surviving have improved, it's by you know no means a certainty. And then points out that there's a liberty ship made from concrete below. That doesn't sound very bold. Uh, I wouldn't be building a ship from... But maybe, I don't know. It probably is accurate. But yeah. a strange thing to... Mention if it was nonsense. That's true. Sam and Al both see this ship and then Cooper returns and sits on or in Al. Yeah, he turns off the autopilot and is told about the deviation to avoid the, the, the thunder bumper. He's also told about this Liberty ship, but when he looks out the window, there's nothing to be seen. Ooh. This obviously makes him feel very uneasy again. Yeah. I should say as well, when he turned off the autopilot, he told Sam that if he keeps flying with black boxes, he'll end up in one. So obviously... Sam's not broken character too much there by yeah. going back to that facility. But when Sam leaves to go back through to the cabin again, Coop seems to enter this trance and gets these oral flashbacks once more, which concerns the watching Al, who then cries, we're back, as the compass goes haywire. I should note that the phantom calls that he's hearing do reference a liberty ship specifically yeah also we're back is a nod to uh, poltergeist i believe okay they're back i think she says a little girl can't remember in the cabin sam looks in on michelle who reports that the pain has now reduced to a dull ache yeah everyone seems to be doing fine and they think it's just a, a food related problem but sam is not convinced and wants a blanket for her as she is freezing cold even though everyone else is roasting when Sam asks Wendy to get her some water, Grant adds on a, a rider to that order, asking for a scotch, which leads to Sam chastising him quite aggressively. I thought it was a bit out of order here. I mean, back in the day, a stiff drink is often what you'd be prescribed. Well, I think maybe, but I don't think Grant's tone is like, I need a scotch because this is nerve wracking. It's mm -hmm. like, you're getting drinks, get me a drink. And you'd... I think Sam is aware that this is not getting better. Yeah. So Grant, I think, is celebrating that Michelle feels better, mm -hmm. and Sam's trying to reiterate to him that well, she's not a, getting better. Yeah, here. but see, that's uh, that's out of order then because yeah. Sam is leading them to believe that it's. Or at this point, he thinks it's fine, and Sam's not said anything else. So yeah, he should have said like she's mm. not getting better. Yeah, but maybe didn't want to scare them. In the galley, Wendy joins Sam, and we hear why Michelle appears to have improved, and it's not good news. If you're looking for the aspirin, I've got it. No, I'm looking for an angel catheter. A what? An angio. I'm 56. I thought you said she was getting better. Her appendix is burst. Oh, God. Yeah, that's why the pain is gone. She's going into shock now. Her blood pressure's dropping, and I've got to get a saline IV into her. And there's no saline solution, and there's no damn IV. Uh, did, did you boil that water? Yeah, for tea, but it's cold. I can heat it no, up. No, 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 wait a second, wait a second. Give me some salt, okay? And put another pot of water on the boil. We'll use the boiling water to sterilize the syringe, 
and whatever else we can find to improvise as an IV. I need tubing and a funnel of some kind. I've got something. Sam, what are you doing? You don't have time to be fixing dinner. We're in the middle of the triangle. Yeah. Michelle's appendix burst. Oh, no. Yeah, she's going into shock now. That's how she died, Al. But if I can get the saline solution into her, it'll elevate her blood pressure until we reach Bermuda. Will this work? Oh, boy. We should say that the thing that Wendy is suggesting is one of those oxygen uh, bags that drops from the... The ceiling when your plane depressurizes. Indeed. So they have this drip in Michelle now, and she. It was, it was a nice little skip ahead, wasn't it? No one, Sam didn't have to explain why he was trying to inject but things I, I, into I, her yeah, arm. I don't think you want to. They wanted to show this, this sort of happening being implemented. She's been unconscious for ten um, for ten minutes before starting to come round and asks for Junior, who again quite lovingly strokes her face. So we're, we're seeing here that the first thing that she asked for is is him. I think it's a genuine relationship. Yeah, there's any doubt about that. Sam explains that the, the drip saved her life and then goes to get some water. However, Al has bad news. What's that? History has been changed. They oh. no longer fly back to Norwich and lose Michelle one hour before they land. Oh, well, that sounds fine then. Now everybody just disappears. Ah. Up in the cockpit, we see Cooper is clearly struggling. Yeah, he is again hearing or envisaging these, these uh, flashbacks. In the galley, we see Al start to fade in and out as he tries to blame the triangle. Mm, Sam is stunned by this, but is interrupted by Junior looking for the water and then candidly asking him in a, a worried tone if Michelle is going to die. Again, we're seeing that he's genuinely concerned. Absolutely. He's heard that when your appendix bursts, you get sepsis and die, I presume. Mm. Sam assures him that with proper treatment, she will be fine and... Grant assures him that Sam will never forget this and nor will his father. He will always have a job with them. <laughs> and when he leaves, Sam sarcastically thinks that's what he needs. A lifetime flying in the Bermuda Triangle. Well, he doesn't believe in the Bermuda Triangle. It's fine. Up in the cockpit, we now see Cooper engaging with this fantasy that he was only hearing previously. Yeah, he seems to be immersed in, in, in these flashbacks and he thinks that he's spotted a U-boat, which he decides to dive down to attack. Yeah, we see him swoop low over the ocean, make a shooting noise. Uh, does he make the noise? He certainly pulls his fingers <laughs> on the button. <laughs> <laughs> pew, 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 pew. <laughs> as, he, as he plunges into the clouds, uh, I think we see the lightning does sh strike in reality. Yeah, well, this was a bit confusing. Yeah. So he kind of returns to his normal mental state as he tries to bring the plane back up. And Wendy comes in to ask what happened. Well, yeah, Sam has taken his seat in the, the co-pilot chair. He tries to wake him from this or, or, or get him out of this trance by shouting that the war is over and that there is indeed no U-boat below. Yeah, he then tries to drop non-existent bombs as well, I think. He does, and when Wendy comes in, Sam tells her that Cooper has been reliving his last mission. He denies it, but Wendy says he does it in his sleep as well. Yeah. He has no memory of the mission, according to Wendy, though. No. But that might not be true, as we learn later on. Yeah, so Wendy says he's blocked out, you know, this, this trauma. Yeah. And Sam just goes, ah, oh, no, he's unblocked it now. Yeah, it's fine. That's what's happening. So he decides to interrogate him. Well, uh, yes, I, th I think Coop shows some aggression as he admits that he lost them after promising he would get them home. Yes, he's killed them, but he's also seen them out there and they're calling to him he, and they want him to join them, I think. So this is ghosts then he's talking about, yeah. it must be, because... If they're dead, then who who are they? Join me at the bottom of the sea. Yeah, Davy Jones and all that type of stuff. Wendy gives him a hug and he tells Sam that they heard music on the radio. But now, is he talking about now or is he talking about then? Because yeah, because Sam sort of hears it as well, I think. Yeah. No, but that's, I think Sam hears actual music and then thinks that perhaps when Coop heard it, he that thought it was. Him into the, yeah. Yeah. At this point, there's a reference to being hit by lightning, and I think they actually are hit by lightning. Yeah, Coop mentions he's almost predicting what's yeah. about to happen. And they are hit by lightning, and Wendy hits the button to kill the fire in the engine. The strike has caused the, the plane to plunge again, and Sam struggles to right it and shouts for Coop to help, but he again is in this sort of trance, so he's not responding. Sam tells him that the storm isn't his fault, and meanwhile we see Grant and Michelle hanging on to one another for dear life through in the 
cabin. Coop's having a, a breakdown. Yes, but eventually Sam pulls him out of it through sheer force of yelling. <laughs> well, so this is the thing as well, that Wendy's standing behind her husband, or behind the two of them. Yep. At no point does she decide to try and help Sam by grabbing the controls and no. pulling it back. She's obviously a, a small, weak woman who cannot, yeah. even in this time of stress, try and pull a, a steering column. Fortunately, uh, screaming at him seems to cure, <laughs> cure his PTSD. I'm surprised you didn't <laughs> give him a slap. That normally works. <laughs> well, yeah, that would be the next step. Uh, Cooper does help pull the plane out of the immediate trouble, but says they need to lose weight. That's a bit weird, this. Yeah, very. I mean, yeah, I mean, why do they need to lose weight? That's normally when you're running out of fuel. Because they've lost an engine. Ah, yeah, okay. So they don't have enough power to pull right. up from yeah. the sea level. Sure. So Sam goes back into the cabin and, with the help of Junior, throws some luggage out of the... He says, the window. You don't have like, windows. That you yeah, can just that was weird as well. <laughs> really? We'll just open the door. <laughs> That's <laughs> it. And throw some stuff out. Even that is not enough. So they start... This, this annoyed me. They start tossing out seats. I think... Uh, I think Wendy, as it says, or somebody says, we've well, thrown everything out that's not bolted down. So he says, ah, we'll throw the stuff that is bolted down. Where did they, do you know how hard it must be to yeah. release a, a, a plane seat? It's ridiculous. You would have to, firstly, you'd have to have the tools at hand, and then those things aren't look easily coming off. No, I wouldn't have, I think this is ridiculous. Anyway, it's absolute nonsense. Somehow they managed to lift out an entire seat, put it out, how does it fit out the window? A, a window? <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. Uh, and the plane uh, begins to climb. We see gradually it recovers. and Yeah, it does the trick and they rise above the clouds and they're able to see Bermuda not far off in the distance. Uh, well, it could be any island. Could it? I don't know. But it could be Jamaica. <laughs> no, I didn't. It was, she went and she didn't have her own free will. Okay. Anyway. They then land in the water near the island of Bermuda as Michelle apologises once more for all the trouble she's caused. Wendy tells her she didn't cause the storm and Sam notes that Everything is working again. Michelle is also looking comfortable enough considering she's got a burst appendix. Yeah, you would think she'd be a bit more concerned. Yeah. Al shows up again and says that technically they're out of the triangle and that's why everything is working. But it's not Ziggy's opinion. I think Ziggy thinks it's a, a power failure. But as they're heading to safety, Sam is able to question both Coop and Al for a final time on their belief in the supposed paranormal activity. You really believe in the Bermuda Triangle, don't you? Yes! I don't know. I swear my boys were out there flying just off our wing. And could that have all been my imagination? No. Yes. I mean, the instruments, the Liberty ship, and everything happening again? Coincidence are scientifically explainable. Awesome. Look, it's obvious that there's some sort of an electromagnetic force operating in this area, but that doesn't make it supernatural. I mean... Isn't the North Pole an electromagnetic disturbance? But we don't say that it's caused by ghosts. What about the Liberty ship? In 1956, there had to be a few Liberty ships still in use, right? And the music. Was the music the exact same music that you heard on your first mission? <laughs> Maybe not. I... What side do you want? And the lightning. I mean, we're flying a plane in a thunderstorm. Planes get hit by lightning all the time. I don't believe you. And most importantly, Everything didn't happen again. You didn't crash, and you weren't in the ocean for eight days in a May West. Although, uh, I wasn't in the water those eight days in days in 44. I was by the USS Cyclops the day I went in. Seven days later, she was torpedoed. Went down with everyone but me. Afraid of the Michael Z picked me up the next day. Now, twice in eight days, I was the only survivor. Well, that is quite a coincidence. Yeah. I guess so. Uh, Sam, the USS Cyclops disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle in 1918. 26 years before Cooper was picked up. Hmm. Indeed. Spooky. Yeah. I puzzled Sam as we hear leaps and that's the end of the story yeah where does he leap he is on the set of a television show where he's challenged by a guy in a military helmet gets caught in between two guys arguing and then head butted to the ground yeah military it's like a hell's angel yeah 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 we'll discuss that next week we will were you satisfied with this conclusion it was a bit of fun wasn't it yeah yeah it's a light-hearted yeah I mean, it could, it could have been a role. sort of um 
Halloween type um, yeah, I mean, episode. They were kind of playing with the idea of the yeah. Bermuda Triangle. They're kind of saying, oh, well, we can't draw conclusions. Yeah, well, we can because it's nonsense. But anyway. Yeah. Do you think that Grant will remain compassionate and loving going forward? I think so, yeah. And he'll lose his entitled nature? No, he, he's, a, he's a very yeah, he's a rich things. kid. Yeah. But I think he'd be perfectly uh, civil, civil to mm. his wife. You ever had appendicitis? No. Oh, well, I'll tell you, about the t have I told you this before? What's that? Well, when I was, uh, I think it's about 13 or 14, I pretended I did have to get off school. And I'll, I'll make this quick. So I said to my concerned parents that, oh, my stomach, and I knew that that's roughly where it was. And I, yeah. and I knew that that would be taken seriously. So I got up to the, they, they took me up to the hospital, so I'm emergency, and uh, with my mum. And the nurse uh, says, oh, we'll have a look, we'll have to investigate it. And I never knew how they would investigate this. So they, they pressed around d down that, that, that area. And yeah. I played along. I went, oh, ah, all right. And then the nurse drew the, the curtains. And she said to me, I was in a gown at this point. Yeah. She said to, to me, um, I'm totally naive here, uh, lie on your side and can you raise your uh, legs to your, uh, your knees to your chest? And I still had no idea. And I just see my mum's face changing. And she stepped out. And then the next thing, yeah, Doctor Jellyfinger was uh, was was in the, on the scene. The test. And uh, she, I remember at one point, she was uh, right up me, and she says, "Oh, if it's any, if it's any consolation, uh, this happened to me uh, when I was your age." And I thought, "No, no, no, it's, it's not any uh, consolation whatsoever. This is really weird and strange." And I had no, needless to say, that I um, I, I toned down my. Um, my antics when it came to uh, skipping school uh, from from then on, I was uh, yeah, I was taught a lesson. <laughs> that sounds like a this yeah. kind of lesson that you have to learn more just once. Yeah. I've had appendicitis twice. Have you? First That's time. A, somebody's yeah. made a mistake there. Well, I had it when I was eleven, and they went in and they found it had settled down. They said left it when you didn't really take it out exactly. anyway. Exactly. A year later, burst. That would that that is ridiculous. Yeah. So I, I've got a nice scar. They I think they went in the same scar again. Right. Okay. Um, and I have no appendix. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, you don't need it. It's just a risk. It can kill you and it can't do anything for you. Yeah. So I'm glad I don't have an appendix. Anyway. Let's get, let's get on with the, the trivia then. Okay. So this originally aired on the 4th of March, 1992, directed by Anita W. Addison, the second of her two episodes. You can hear more about her in the podcast for Dreams. It was written by Paris Qualls, or Qualles, second of their two as well. Go back to Unchained to hear more. There's also a writing credit for Donald Belisario on this one. Captain Cooper, played by Scott Hawksby. This was his only quantum leap. He's also in The Living Daylights, The Young and the Restless, Tortured, the Doctor Who spin-off, Mad Men. He's now 68 and his last screen credit was 2015. Wendy was played by Kimberly Foster. Again, her only quantum leap. She was lovely. She's also in things like Dallas, Knight Raider, The A-Team and All My Children. She's now 62 and after marrying in 1994, her last screen credit was 1995, so she retired from TV acting. Junior was played by Kurt Deutsch, his only quantum leap. He's also in things like Matlock, Models Inc., Law and Order, Sex in the City. He's now 57, but he's only made one screen appearance since the turn of the century. And the one member of the cast that has a bit of a CV to look at is Carla Gugino. Now, I, yeah, uh, she is, uh, is gorgeous. She was, I remember as a, she was in the, the, the Bon Jovi video and I always remember watching it. Always, I think it was. That's the first time I was aware of her. And uh, in that video, she was cheated on by her boyfriend. And I always thought, you're an idiot because <laughs> the one you cheated on was, it was nice, but she was different class in that. I think she was also in Snake Eyes, if I remember. Okay. This was her only quantum leap. Um, she's been in lots of things even more recently she's been in things like chicago hope haunting of hill house the haunting of bly manor the fall of the house of usher these are all big netflix hits from recent years in 2008 she was nominated by the alliance of women film journalists for most egregious age difference between the leading man and the love interest okay. after appearing opposite robert de niro 31 years her senior in righteous kill uh, that is, that's fair enough however in real life you know, that's how it's, you know, he's a, a, was a father the other year, wasn't he? I'm sure his wife now is younger than yeah, well, she yeah. is. Yeah. She's now 52, still active. In terms of trivia, a good one was uh, Captain Cooper's sleeve patch. You saw it Felix the Cat on it. Right. So it's for the VFA-31. It's a real um, Navy fighter attack squadron formed in 1935. They're called the Tomcatters. They use Felix as their call sign. Uh, and the logo, Felix is carrying a bomb. Uh, multiple callbacks in this episode, and this is what we referred to during the episode, uh, to an earlier a Donald Belisario series called Tales of the Gold Monkey, which includes a character called Captain Cooper, and this is where the exterior plane shots have come from. 
The USS Cyclops, the mystery ship that was referred to at the end, was a real US ship lost at sea in March 1918. No cause was ever discovered. In terms of anachronism, there's a ref multiple references to the, we doing the triangle. Have we done that Well, we've said before we think this must be parallel university stuff right, because yeah. the real in real life, the phrase Bermuda Triangle didn't come up for another eight years mm -hmm. after this. Uh, first mentioned in an article in Argosy magazine. In terms of things that we learned, we've got Sam doesn't enjoy flying by himself. Al believes in this sort of nonsense. And Sam doesn't. And he remembers, or they both remember, the test pilot flights in Genesis, the first episode of the show. In terms of on this date, the only thing I've got for the 13th of August, 56, series of UFO sightings by military bases in the east of England, known collectively as the Lake and Heath Bentwaters incident. Appropriate. Yes. Do you have anything else? Yeah, not specifically to 1956, but August the 13th is International Lefties Day, Left Handers Day. Okay. Number ones. Okay. In the UK, we had Doris Day with whatever will be, will be. Well, in the USA, it was Elvis again with Don't Be Cruel. Fantastic. Next week, we have Roberto with an exclamation mark, where Sam has to uncover a deeply hidden secret at a chemical plant. So, we will see you in 1982. Until then, cheerio. Bye-bye.